Hello. Welcome to the October 2022 Composing Composition Competition live stream. We had over 500 composers submit an original piece of orchestral music. Today, I've chosen 15 of them to present to our judges. All the pieces were inspired by a work of art from Andy Walsh. So thank you, Andy, for letting us use your work as inspiration. So what we're going to do is listen back to the 15 finalists, share our thoughts and reactions, and then at the end of the stream, we will crown a winner. So this month's competition is sponsored by Museversal, and we are grateful to have the amazing prizes they are offering. It's pretty crazy. So third place receives three credits for Museversal to use for recording live musicians. Second place wins five credits, and the first place uh, winner will have their piece recorded by the 30-piece Czech National Symphony Orchestra, which is crazy and amazing. So thank you again, Museversal. Uh, just so you know, Museversal is having a Black Friday sale with 33% off their subscription plans. So definitely go check them out. There's a link in the description, and it's museversal.com. So here's how this is going to work. In some of the previous composition competitions we had, production value was one of the criteria. But here we have leveled the playing field. Everyone is having their piece played back by Note Performer, which is just like a notation software playback engine. So we're going to listen to each entry while following along with the score. Then the judges are going to rate them on composition, relevance to the image, and orchestration. So composition is things like form, motivic development, are the transitions convincing, things like that. Relevance means does it you know, match the feel of the image? Even if it's not our personal interpretation, is it a convincing interpretation to go with kind of the story the picture is telling? And then orchestration is going to take into account things like, are they making use of the available instruments in the orchestra? Is the arrangement balanced? And things like that. Uh, so to keep the spirit of the competi competition friendly, we're keeping the scores behind the scenes. But if you are one of the finalists and you want to know your actual score, shoot me an email when this is over, and I'll be happy to share that with you. So let me introduce you to our judges first. We have Mark Richards of filmmusicnotes.com, a former university professor in music theory who creates online courses in film music harmony and composition on his Film Music Notes site. For those watching today, he's offering 15% off most courses with a Black Friday sale uh, with the code BF22RL, which is BF for Black Friday, 22 for the year, and RL for Ryan Leach. So the code is good until November 30th, that's in the description. Some of you may also recognize Mark from our recent Mozart versus Pokemon video, which in a week became the second most viewed video on my channel, which is crazy. So welcome, Mark. Good to have you here. Uh, Christopher C.U. is next. He's a composer, arranger, and fellow YouTuber who's worked with artists such as Tina Guo and Catherine Dern, Stephen Mellon, and Jonathan and Friends. He has a passion for classic Disney and orchestral Nintendo scores, which is why we're friends, and has recently released his debut album, Freedom, available for listening wherever music is consumed. He's dedicated to helping musicians find their voice and produce the music they've always dreamed of. Chris also has a Black Friday sale going on with a 60% off a bundle of his courses, Cinematic Music Creation, Songwriting for Animation, and Expressive String Arranging. So check out ChristopherCU.com slash store for more info, also in the description. And we have Gavin Leeper. Gavin Leeper is a composer inspired by Japanese games and anime. A self-taught jazz musician and Japanese cultural aficionado, Gavin is regarded as a YouTube expert on the music theory of Japanese video game music, anime music, and other contemporary Japanese styles. Gavin recently released his original orchestral piece, Akigami. He sent me a copy of the score, which is beautifully engraved. Thank you for that, Gavin. Uh, there's a help. great video on his channel featuring the live musicians he recorded for that. So there's a link to that video in the description as well. Uh, and one final shout out to Celeste and John, who've been working in the background, helping me manage the insanity that is this live stream and competition. So thank you guys so much for your help. I think we are ready. That's the, that's the end of the spiel. You guys ready to go? Let's do it. <clears throat> okay. We're good. Let's go. So these were 
arranged uh, completely in random order. We just shuffled them. And the first one we have is Wet's Halloween by Leon C. Nice work. So I know the volume on the on the music is going to be a little quieter, so we're going to have to jump up and back a little bit. Um, let's see. How about Mark? Why don't you start us off with your first impressions? All right. Um, so the first thing I noticed about this was the opening was all this octatonic stuff, and you know, I really love that. Um, it just my ears are so attuned to octatonic music after analyzing so much of it. Um, so so good use of all this dissonance and strange harmonies there. Um, for the opening section. And um, the central section marked A in the score measure nine. I, I know you can't really refer to that so easily here, but I uh, had a really lovely, strange and distorted material going on here with some kind of unexpected harmonies and melodic intervals. I thought it could, creates a good uh, sense of this playful eeriness, which I think the image has a lot of. It's, it's a little bit cartoonish with the, the image, I mean. You know, a little bit of a that kind of feel, but there there is this strange eeriness as well. And I think that gets it across nicely there. Um, in terms of the uh, harmonies, there were like things like tritone progression with minor chords, which generally suggests something dangerous when you hear it in film, a sort of a, a film trope. Um, and you hear the minor one chord to major two progression. So actually, if I just pull this over to my keyboard, maybe you can hear what I'm talking about. So, so that kind of progression, just, it sounds uh, like for mystery or even a kind of dark humor, you hear that a lot in film music. So it, it's good. It's very um, harmonically appropriate. Um, nice balance of instruments with the orchestration, good use of different textures. Um, so really, like, the only suggestion I might have is to have fewer themes. I think I counted something like five different themes over the whole stretch of the whole thing, which is great to have so many ideas. You know, many composers just kind of stuck with what to do next, but that's clearly not the case here. Um, so maybe just concentrate on fewer themes, especially because it's a shorter kind of thing. But um, overall, really great stuff. So well done. Yeah, like uh, in, in my opinion, like, I I thought this piece sounded um, quite extraordinary in terms of I think what it was trying to achieve. Uh, I just really enjoyed the overall mood. Like Mark was talking about the octatonic feel, and then some of those uh, tritone staccatos back and forth near the very end. It kind of had that uh, jumpy, uh, almost nervous feeling in there which was really really nice um but mainly what stood out to me was just the overall orchestration was not overly done i think because when you have an entire ensemble it's really easy to do too much with it in a lot of ways 
and especially on the last page, I think there was this big crescendo into that that last theme. Um, and to me, nothing, especially in no performer where it's so easy to hear these samples sounding terrible, um, they actually sounded quite balanced and everything actually felt like it had a certain reason for being there, which is uh, sh shows a good taste in what you're trying to achieve and prioritize in those instruments. So um, I think there was also just a good balance overall of um, having fewer instruments and certain more delicate moments, having the themes more in the woodwinds and having the other textures accompany for more of a lighter feel, right? And then in those big moments, you really brought up those dynamics and use the instruments effectively there with the, the brass and the strings and stuff. So I thought all in all, the orchestration was, was very detailed and really well thought out. So I just want to congratulate you on that for sure. Yeah, I really enjoyed, like, I feel you know, similar to what Mark was saying, there's, there's, it's very motivic writing and there were so many ideas that I didn't know what to come away with was, is, would be like my only piece of feedback. Um, there, the motifs that were there were good ones. Um, so, you know, don't show us all your cards all at once. Save, save some for the rest of the score, you know? Um, and I think in terms of orchestration, uh, the thing that stuck out the most to me was the effectiveness of some of the ornaments uh, that we see here, like these, you know, these runs and the strings, uh, like a lot of potential or attention to detail with um, who's who's trilling at what point, like harp glissandi. There was a lot of sort of attention to the extra bits that are not necessarily melody or accompaniment or counter melody. Um, so just wanted to point that out as a, a strength as well. Nice. Okay. Shall we go to the next one? Sure. All right. Um, I just want to point out, so we were, uh, when the stream started on our end, we saw a video from Museversal, and apparently nobody else saw it <laughs> over the live stream, uh, oh. which is confusing because we watched it on our end. Uh, so, you know, when... I don't want to break up the flow of, of the entries, but when we tell you the scores, I'll play that back for everybody. Okay. So the next one we have is The Rise of the Pumpkin from Theophile Iver. Uh, and if you guys could mute your microphones and we'll be all set. That, that last chord was something. <laughs> it was almost like a, a a full chord, like a full tri there. Um, and then there's like a, I forgot exactly what kind of stuff snow there was in there or whatever. But um, yeah, I think this one, uh, I'm, I'm sure we would agree, had a very consistent sort of theme going on throughout. And uh, it was pretty easy to follow with the different sections. The theme was um, typically quite uh, easily identifiable in there. <clears throat> and the other elements were all kind of interacting beautifully in a way. Um, to support what was happening. And again, the dynamic contrast was pretty evident throughout. Like you could hear there's a lot of thought that went into the arrangement overall. 
um, good use of articulations, good use of um, just different playing techniques, I think, in general. And <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think for both of these pieces so far, just having moments where the instruments are kind of pulling back and allowing the more delicate instrumentations to come through and then everything growing together near the end to establish that main theme one more time in the brass, which is so declamatory and really strong, ending off with a nice big chord at the very end, uh, creates a lot of interest and momentum in the piece, which I uh, really, really did enjoy. So um, yeah, no, I, I thought it was, thought it was really nice. How about Gavin, you want to take us next? Um, nothing much to add, really, except uh, that I'm impressed by note performers' uh, performance on some of these quick runs. <laughs> like, yeah. it doesn't sound very fake, honestly. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we can have this level playing field and people can get creative, too. It's not super constrained sonically. So that's just an observation. Well, so um, I liked a lot of things about this piece. So the irregular key scheme was nice to go up in perfect fifths. You're going from D minor, A minor, E minor. Um, you know, actually you're starting in C, C, and then you went to G and then D, A, E, just this kind of cycle of going up in fifths. And so often in tonal music, you, you go down in fifths is sort of like the typical 5-1 progression. You go up to five and, you know, if you're using like classical you know, kinds of forms, but um, it's nice to have this kind of elevation of the tension as you go through the form. Um, so I like that. And it, and as uh, Chris already said, is motivically very coherent. Um, it's almost like a theme in variations. And that just speaks to the strength of the motivic material. Um, so good things there. Um, now, in terms of anything I'd recommend, um, some of the transitions used um, diminished seventh chords to sort of protract that sense of tension. Um, it, there's no, nothing wrong with a diminished seventh chord. I just I might try other things in there, maybe just throw in an extra dissonant semitone just to throw things off, or maybe some other augmented chord with a seventh on it. Um, just for example, this kind of thing. Yeah, just, you know, something different just to throw in there, make it a little unexpected. Um, that kind of thing. It's a very small point, but uh, I might try that. Now, in terms of relevance, I like the kind of cheekiness, the spirit of this one captured that, the sense of the, the image as well. As we said, sort of a cartoonish eeriness as well. Not to say that it can't be serious, but that was the interpretation here. Uh, and the orchestration, uh, very nicely done. Uh, Chris was saying as well, getting lots of different colors out of the ensemble, uh, very nicely done. So. Um, and th then the passing of the melody through the different instruments was nicely handled. So overall, good stuff. Yeah, I'll just point out that it's been several minutes and I can still remember the main theme, which I think is a really good strength. Like I could, I could sing it back. So how about we head to the next one? All right. Sounds next good. we have, oh, what's that? All right. I said, sounds good. Sounds good, okay. Uh, Danse de Calèche, I don't speak French, uh, from Kristen Simpson. I mute my mic here.
Gavin, how about you start us off? Wow, very, very cool, very active. Like, I liked how much the um, the melody was being passed around. It felt like a different different person was center stage um, almost every four bars or something. Um, I thought that was really strong. Um, and uh, I don't know. I think that's I think that's the main thing I was able to to catch. Um, what do you guys think? Um, so. I liked a lot of the the grotesque aspect of this, this kind of Elfman-like waltz that appears just <laughs> out of nowhere in the middle of the piece. It's great. Um, had this appropriately spooky opening, um, which sort of hinted at things to come. I liked the sort of, you know, Darth Vader progression, just to play you that, you know. Uh, I, you know, there is some of that in the opening as well, just to get the kind of spookiness across. So harmonically very apt. Um, and as, in terms of the waltz, I would because I like that so much. I would just love to see it uh, as as a larger part of the whole uh, piece. And and interestingly, though, there were little hints of it in little bits of melody before and after. So it wasn't just sort of faster chase music and then juxtaposed with this elegant waltz. It was something that was hinted at throughout. But I'd, I'd love to see more of that because it's just such a good tune, a good idea. Um, <clears throat> just even make more of it. Uh, in terms of orchestration, um, it, it was a great choice. It had this colenio effect, so with the wood. And um, some players like to use a different bow for that or even like a different stick or something just to not damage their bow because some of these things can be very expensive. So it um, might be good just to give them a little bit of more time to adjust to that, um, that effect. So if, if you're writing colenio, just one, one thing to, to watch for, but an excellent choice for sure. So yeah, that's, those are my comments. Good stuff. Yeah, just to quickly piggyback on the, the, the waltz part, I think that was probably my favorite part too. And uh, probably the most tonal part as well, I think, right? Because the, the bass, you get the A, G sharp, A, G sharp, A. <laughs> so you get the back and forth between um, the, the tonic and kind of the dominant sound, which is really nice. And it keeps you on your toes. But then, uh, like Mark already mentioned, you have this like uh, rising element with the, the non-tonal stuff and all the elements working together, which is really beautiful. Um, and then one quick little orchestration thing I was just want to mention at the very beginning, you had these uh, like t high violin textures. I think they were playing light trebles and stuff. And you also had, I believe it was the horns playing these uh, piano notes. Uh, it's probably just no performer, but because the horns are playing in that middle C type of register, it looks like, yeah, somewhere, somewhere there. Um, they're uh, maybe slightly lower than middle C. Then the oboe melody playing MP, um, there were a couple of notes there that were just, I think, masked by a couple of those horn notes, or maybe it was something in the strings as well, maybe being a little bit louder. But I guess in a, in a real life context, we would really want those supporting elements to be kind of pushed down and, and uh, you know, written with a quite a quiet dynamic to let that oboe come through. Um, but aside from that, like, I think we heard everything pretty well. And I really just enjoyed the fact that there were three kind of separate unique sections. And it actually felt like I was taken on a, on a story, kind of a journey from start to finish, all culminating to the, the final, you know, ending. And I, I saw someone mention uh, like a delayed ending, which I thought was really nice. And um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to, to hear for sure. Question for you, Mark. So, if if you wanted to give the strings players a some notice with the switch to Colenio, would you? How would you notate that here? Oh, I just mean a few bars of or like a bar of rest, and they would know oh, if they musically. if they wanted to switch musically. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if they wanted to switch, they could. Some people don't have a problem just you know flipping their bow around and tapping on the back, but someone <laughs> if they're having like a you know Stradivarius or something, you know, they'd want to probably do something else with it <laughs> makes sense yeah i guess i was just wondering because sometimes you see in percussion parts like switch to this thing so maybe you know you could say switch to colenio mm. upcoming in four bars or something like that oh so yeah maybe if it was like a, a sight reading session that might be right something to, to do but you know Which this I, probably will be okay for the most right part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right but yeah yeah. But we're going to, before, before this, you know, this is not the, the final score that gets submitted. Like, we'll have time to go through mm, those kinds right. of things for sure. 
Yeah. There's definitely a balance to having, I think, like um, too, too many directions and then not enough, right? I think in jazz, though, some people uh, really appreciate having um, at, at least some, some direction, like the drummers like having those slash marks and then you writing those directions on top. But again, you don't want to over notate because you want to trust the performers too. But I think in the context mm -hmm. of an orchestral score, literally just saying Cole Lane, you know, maybe a bar before is usually good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, makes yeah. Sense. Cool. Shall we head to number four? Let's do it. All right. We have Phantom Rider from Frank Herigold. Okay. I'm going to mute. I, I can't quite place it, uh, but something something in the middle there had. I, I feel like there there was like like Schumann came to mind that there was some sort of like kind of early romantic feel feel in that, but I can't quite. Is that E major chord, man. Is that <laughs> after it? all the dissonance? It's just like, like yeah. it just came in for two bars, and then it. I don't know. That was that was so yeah. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Okay, who's first? How about Mark? Yes. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry, I was just trying Welcome to stay. Back. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I really like the extra bars of the different time signatures here. It's a good way to express the kind of strange and fantastical elements in the image. Um, now, as far as the structure goes of the whole piece, I heard a sort of ABA plus more of an extended coda. I mean, I probably wouldn't call it a C section, but something just like ABA with extended coda. Um, so this B section was nice. It was it, it was contrasting in motivic material as, as well as you know harmonic structure and all of this. Um, you could go another route and and make it more unified and draw motives from the A section. It's just it, it's hard because you have such a strong melody for the A section, and it's one of those ones that I you know I can still re recall after hearing it. Um, so it, it's nice that it. it is it's its own thing um i guess personally i would i would choose to try and draw what you can from that for the b section just to unify that develop it um but you know it's it's fine to abandon these motives and and do something totally different but then that new thing um might be carried forward and used a substantial amount more so lots of good ideas here um, it's just a sense of proportion, I think, in the B section. I would have liked to hear either more of that, or you go the other way and you bring in more of the A section, that kind of thing. Anyway, the um, orchestration-wise, the climax, great idea here, gives the whole piece this kind of overarching structure. Um, and um, yeah, I think that was, I mean, the orchestration worked well for me. You know, I think it was well balanced, nice use of instrumentation, different colors. I think those are my comments. Good stuff. Yeah, so um, it, it's it's 
another such so like I feel like this time around there are so many interesting, unique interpretations of this of this one piece. And we had already kind of covered um, the different time signatures, the different orchestration techniques, then just feeling like there are so many different ideas. And to carry on from that, I think this piece specifically for me, there was a quite a strong theme um, as Mark mentioned, but I think because there was so much going on for me, um, I, I had a little bit of trouble after the piece kind of remembering it right away from uh, just from you know from from listening to it again, I'd have to hear it a couple of times probably, but I was probably um, listening a lot to the different orchestration choices there, the different articulations, especially with those grace note descending things near the end there. That I was like, wow, that, I haven't heard that one in a long time. Uh, I've heard that before. Um, so so many ideas and different devices being used here in terms of instrumentation and orchestration that it was a little difficult for me to really grasp onto a central like idea that I really wanted to hear more of. Um, but overall, I think the, like all of the, all the decisions you made, I think they were intentional. There were certainly um, great ideas for them, um, but it just felt slightly convoluted to me in, in some small ways. But overall, as Ryan mentioned, there was this moment of romanticism in there that I think just completely took us by surprise. And that, that chord for sure was really, Beautiful. I think it was only for you know two bars as you were transitioning into the next section, but it was totally unrelated to the key. And then I think you, in the brass you also had some you know augmented triads going on there to create that that eerie feeling that works really well. So a bunch of great ideas overall. And uh, I think as Mark said, just having it slightly more contained and um, slightly more cohesive overall would be uh, make it just you know perfect. Yeah, um, sim similar feedback to, to Chris that, you know, there's there's just so many, I mean, it's easy with, with orchestral writing, right? Like it, it sort of in one way or another requires a lot of ideas, um, but there's so many motivic ideas um, that overall it's hard to know what to come away with. Um, but I, I also liked all the, like there's so much tuplet work in here like someone was mentioning the effectiveness of the um there's like a three against two moment um and i thought you know rhythmically that was that was quite cool um but uh but yeah i would say you know it seems like what some of our feedback is getting at with a couple of these pieces that, is that at least in terms of what the the meta organism is doing what the entire orchestra is doing sometimes sometimes less is more um so that we can we can come away with uh this song goes like doop a doop a doop you know uh so i this song goes many different ways <laughs> but that's the thing too right really quickly is just that because this is sort of a halloween theme it feels more impromptu in some ways and so it's hard to tell whether the composer was going for a main theme that is supposed to be really easily remembered or they wanted to keep us on our toes throughout and make us feel you know nervous and anxious and uh all totally. that stuff too so it's hard. all depends on on your aesthetic goals yeah exactly sure. yeah yeah i guess that just has some of my bias of like i i like very memorable very melodic themes <laughs> i'm sure we all do <laughs> yeah. <go> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right <laughs> On that, how about we head to number five? We have Halloween Mischief from Francisco Carabe.
Awesome. Yeah, I mean, an another uh, really well-written piece here. So, uh, yeah, just to kick things off, I think, um, I believe the piece started in E minor as well and ended in E minor. I don't think there were any drastic uh, key changes really here. Um, so, and I believe the whole piece was a little bit on the shorter end as well. So it, it was uh, not, not easier to listen to, but it, it allows us to remember more of it, I think. Uh, which is also nice as well. But um, I think there, it was in bar six, there was a moment where the main theme dips down into uh, the, just the middle C register in the oboe or the flute or something. And then um, the trumpets kind of have this rising figure to match. And then it it accents that, that note in bar seven, the downbeat, um, which kind of covered up the melody slightly for me as the flutes, oboes, uh, clarinets are decrescendoing. I, maybe, maybe that was an intentional choice, but I, I really wanted to hear all three of those uh, half notes there in the woodwinds um, in those couple bars. So maybe it could have, uh, you could have, I guess maybe put it in the harp as well, but maybe you wanted that contrast for the second time around in, uh, you know, bar uh, 12 or whatever it was, where that harp actually does come in. That That's a cool choice there as well. But uh, yeah, orchestration, I think overall, there was quite a lot of um, doubling and layering here going on to bring that theme forward, which is great. Um, just a quick little comment about these parts outside of that main theme. I thought some of the transitional elements, you were using a lot of the orchestra in really creative ways. But as I mentioned kind of in the previous piece, sticking with maybe simpler textures or at least more consistent textures through the different sections can help get that uh, texture across probably a bit stronger compared to having a variety of different articulations that all kind of seem to maybe blend together a little bit. Um, and have the risk of potentially confusing your listeners because they're like, oh, what, what's, what is all this stuff going on here? Maybe let the harmony speak for itself. Let those diminished augmented triads do their thing um, and stick with maybe uh, one or two interesting orchestration choices rather than going with a ton of different articulations in those transition mm -hmm. moments. Um, because as soon as we went back to the main theme, that was super clear, very direct. You can tell you, you, know, you really want us to hear the, those themes and I think that was really strong. So for me, the transitions could have been slightly simpler as well in terms of orchestration to uh, complement the themes a little bit stronger. That's just me. I don't really have an answer for it, but I think one of the, the hardest things about any of these comp competitions, like any month that we've done them, is that 90-second limit and trying to balance show you know doing lots of interesting things and not doing too many things like it's just like there's no right answer in a way sometimes mm -hmm. you know that you like you want to be trying all these different things to your idea you also want to yeah. be limiting and that's i feel like that's got to be the hardest part is just yeah. like keeping it all within that forced structure limit yes it's really tough and please remember these these are all like subjective things we're <laughs> we're mentioning here like ryan said it's there's there's you know there's no right or wrong these are just i think first impressions that come to our mind and they're according to our personal tastes as well so right. i didn't mean that i just mean it's hard no no, no. <laughs> I mean, it's hard for everyone yeah <laughs> totally yeah it's, it's really tough um gavin did you have any thoughts uh most mostly just same um but yeah on the on the bit of like you know personal biases and stuff it turns out no one's trying to do a Studio Ghibli thing on this one, so I have a lot less to say. <laughs> it's so sad, right? Like, yeah, why isn't well, someone doing Mario Galaxy with this? Like, yeah, I mean, there's spooky <laughs> levels in Mario Galaxy. I know, right? You know, I'm, I'm waiting for that. Yeah, I'm waiting to I tap know. in. Yeah. So, so the July competition with that kind of Mononoke-esque yeah. vibe was more was of like, your, your wheelhouse. Right? <laughs> put, put, put me in, coach. <laughs> Yeah, right. and coach. I feel like I am a little less familiar with like what the material that's being referenced here mm -hmm. uh, than I was with previous competitions. So, um, so I'm just going to say the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, I like that this was basically a set of variations on the opening theme. We were talking about uh, Ryan. You said, "How do you structure something that's a minute and a half long?" And a lot of the entries are going for. Um, an ABA type structure, which is always a solid choice. And some of them are going the route of the variations. So this one does the variations. And I'm not saying one is, is better or easier or harder. I think that's a, it's, it's a good bet to do variations because it means that automatically you're kind of going to be unified throughout the whole um, 90 seconds. Now, this one, I love the wonkiness in this one. It's just so appropriate for the image. So for example, the, <clears throat> the opening, if I can just play the two chords you have there, it's like this. <laughs> I 
like that second one, you know, it, it's like planing up a semitone, but then you get this, you know, one five one in the bass. It's like it's all crazy and and wonderfully crazy. Um, <clears throat> now somewhere in the middle, it was measure twenty seven to be exact, because we looked at these beforehand. But the the theme seems to drop out there um, for the rest of the piece, another eleven bars or so. And just because it had that sort of variation quality, I'd love to see it developed even more beyond that point. I know you're, you're probably thinking like, oh, it, it's going to be too much. Um, but so many good ideas in here, and the way you vary them, um, you know, with crazy chords like that, I think you'd be fine. Um, and, and just talking about the image itself, like I think it brings out things like the dilapidated windmill. If you can get a, can we get a uh, screen of that image there for a sec? Because you see that there's a, that's, uh, cool. <laughs> that's okay. Well, you can still see this kind of dilapidated windmill in the background. Um, if you look right on the bottom right corner, there's a smashed pumpkin on the road there. And this kind of eerie sky that, with the moon just peeking out a little bit and weird clouds. It, it's just it's appropriate, I think, to have this kind of strangeness to the structure, to the harmonies. Um, and then in terms of orchestration, again, lots of good passing the theme around different instruments and orchestral groups. And the end had a nice closing effect here. I mean, it's always hard to end things off, but especially in a small form like this, but it was convincingly done. So good stuff. Okay, I think we're on to number six. I'm keeping track right. So number six, Haunted Carriage from Craig Hunter. first Gavin, Gavin's up you <laughs> uh, strong like memorable themes in this one hey <laughs> yeah yeah I, I remember how this one goes yes um, and and you know there was it's not even that we only stuck to one idea like I didn't I didn't totally catch whether there was like a B a like what what the whole form was but there was certainly an a and a B um, and uh, so I think that this person that Craig um, threaded the needle between kind of uh, you know co coherence and and uh, variation, uh, so I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, and the yeah the orchestration was you know it was dynamic and and kept me on my toes as a listener I would say. Uh, so nice job. Of course you did a nice job if you made it here. Um, Very good. Um, so I'd like the uh, just to talk about the harmony here, which is another cool progression for this kind of image. Um, it was right around uh, measure 15 or so, just after the main statement of the, the main theme. We get this kind of progression. If I can just pull you over to my keyboard for a sec. Right, so that's what we call the slide progression. 
And it's something that's used a lot in film to depict something that's incredulous or incomprehensible. Something that is just, it's, it's not just strange, it's something that really is hard to understand. Um, and I think that's that's great. Like I've talked about that with the image. It's just like, what what exactly is going on? It's, it's ambiguous. You know, there's a carriage going along. We're not sure what's inside. Are they racing down? Where are they going? Um, but it's eerie for sure. So I like that progression. It's, it's very, uh, a nice touch um, taken from a lot of film music that uses that same progression. Um, it's, it's the same kind of association here. So good stuff. Um, and in terms of the um, associations, we have the spooky harmonies, we have the galloping rhythms, which you've had a lot of in um, other entries as well. And a sort of, can I say desperate sounding minor mode? It's, it's, it really does sound like we have to get somewhere. And you know, it never got to that like tonic cadence until like <laughs> at the end, I was, I was waiting for that cadence. I was like, oh no, we're not gonna get there. Um, but uh, it, it, so it was nicely crafted. And then to talk about orchestration just briefly, uh, again, good variety of instrumentation. Um, uh, there was this one spot where I thought there could use more room for uh, the brass to breathe a little bit. Uh, maybe if you had really excellent players, they could sort of stagger it to get through it, but I just throw in a couple of rests there myself. Um, so that was from measure 23 to 30, right? Those seven or eight bars there, but otherwise excellent stuff. Good work. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I like. I'm just pulling up the scores now. I totally forgot where the link was, so I have it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. Overall, I think as as uh, Mark and Gavin have both mentioned, the theme itself is uh, very strong here. And this again, one of those situations where you can definitely feel the intention behind the piece is solely on the main theme, and everything else is basically driving the momentum forward. So you have a lot of these uh, eighth followed by two sixteenths patterns going on, da, 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 especially in the violas and the celli. And then you have the double basses with a straight eighth pattern providing some variety there, whereas the woodwinds are kind of doing their own thing as well with the, with the straight eights and um, runs and flourishes as well. And so everything was, I think, really well thought out in terms of orchestration and the theme itself was uh, very, very nice. And then uh, harmonically, I think the one thing that stood out to me was, um, I think is it bar, yes, bar 12, you kind of go from this, B flat major up to this B diminished seventh chord before uh, going back down to the G minor chord. I think that's a really um, interesting move because after that B diminished seventh, I was expecting maybe a F over C or something, right? Like a transition to a major sound, uh, the major three before going back down to the the one tonic minor. But in this case, he actually went down to the four. So kind of uh, uh, varied from our expectations there just a little bit. And I think everyone has, uh, is really putting forth some really awesome endings like the <laughs> that energy just building and building and building and then the second last bar we get that ding, and then da -da -da, and then you just get that big finale ending and um, everything just settles down to that nice finish but um i think everyone's interpreting the image uh really effectively just thinking of different ways to keep us interested um uh, switch up the different articulations uh give the players room to to appreciate what's happening and then go straight back into it, like lots of stuff happening here. And I think the fact that we have this score is just allowing us to appreciate this so much more. So yeah, another great piece for sure. I think requiring the scores scared some people off, however, <laughs> for sure. It's, it's cool to have it while we're listening. I also yeah. wish I had a vertical monitor so that because yeah. it's like these widescreen monitors are just not meant for perusing an orchestral score, you know, mm -hmm. maybe if we had uh, printed them all out and could leave right. through them yeah, and get powdered wigs on. <laughs> all right, let's go to number seven. We have Jack of the Lantern from Gavin Farah.
just want to start by saying I love Note Performer. That's so great. <laughs> I think, uh, is Mark? Are yeah, I'm up. <clears throat> All right. Great stuff. Um, so this is one of the only ones that um, sounds like it could be film underscore. That didn't start with a big theme or something that was hinting at a theme. It was more trying to capture the play-by-play uh, -play of an imagined scene. And, and I, lo I love that because it really does conjure up uh, a narrative or something that is a sequence of events um, as opposed to, say, a theme, which is more about creating a mood and, and creating an appro appropriate sense of expression for that moment. So I love this kind of moment-to-moment -moment changing quality of the uh, of much of this one. Now that said, of course, there's this beautiful theme that comes in and in the center of this, which is great. And I love the kind of dropping down in key. It went from D minor to C sharp minor. I mean, when does that ever happen, right? You go down a semitone, it feels like this is this it dread in the pit of your stomach, just like the bottom falls out of it. Wonderful effect. Um, very colorfully orchestrated. I just love the little, um, one little fragment coming in here, another fragment coming in there. It was all very unified. Um, so I think that's it. I mean, the only the only possible suggestion I would have for really the relevance as opposed to connect it to the image is maybe some chromaticism to come into that theme. I mean, you do have a lot of chromaticism in, in that more underscore part. So it does play off of that nicely. Uh, I just think for me, it would be nice if there was some strange, eerie, weird chord, just like not to uh, overdo it, but just something else in that theme just to, you know, throw a monkey wrench in it somewhere. Um, but but really great stuff. So thanks for that entry. I enjoyed it. Yeah, another uh, wonderful piece. And just like Mark said, I, I believe this one is actually one of the, the slower pieces that happened at least throughout like I, I think all the other pieces had at least some moments where they picked up the tempo and stuff but this one really uh bathed in that that more you know dark kind of mysterious type of feel but uh in terms of the filmic stuff um I, I was totally imagining home alone while hearing this and especially like when he's out in new york um sleeping around looking at, diff in, at different traps and stuff um, not not what, while he's setting up the traps because that's like energetic music, but he's like walking around the street unsure of himself, and then there's people coming up to him, sneering at him. Like those moments there where you're like, I'm kind of unsure what's about to happen. Those uh, parts really just reminded me of um, of that of the film here. And uh, like Mark said, th this transition from D minor to C sharp minor, I think that works really really well. And I actually barely noticed it because I think the transition was so smooth and um, the way you voice leaded everything, like going from you know the yeah, the, the, the two different sections. Um, just uh, very effective there. And the theme overall was was quite uh, well balanced throughout as well. Like good understanding of the different sections and combining violence one and two together for a stronger, a thicker melody and, and with the flute and oboe up an octave, for example. Like all of that stuff contributes to this strong theme that allows the other elements to support uh, very comfortably. And um, yeah, just, just lend a really cohesive approach to the whole thing. So I really like the feel of this um, overall. How about that, uh, that Dorian ending, guys? Yes, of course, that race six was a... Uh... Yeah, <laughs> love, love that. Very true. Yeah, very, very Danny Elfman. Yes. Right, the minor, minor plus added sixth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering how, how y'all would want to name that chord. It's like it's a sort of like a minor major six nine sort of thing, but yeah, raise six. Love that flavor. Uh, continuing the, uh, the the pattern of strong endings, I feel like people are getting very creative with them, which is great. Shall we go to the next one? Let's do it. Okay. Next one is one of our more unique titles. We have The Midnight Visit of the Peculiar Mr. Ryan from Alex Christo de Lou.
All right, Chris, I think you're first on this one. Sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think continue along the filmic route. Like, lots of uh, moments or beats where it felt like there was something specifically happening on screen, um, especially near the beginning. Actually, let me see if I can quickly reference. So, yeah, the first page is totally, totally cool. Um, yeah, I think it's on, like, page two and three around far as like eight and nine when you have those uh the, the horn the muted brass uh yeah muted horns in there um interacting and uh interrupting the triplet patterns that were happening previously in the violas and the the, the celli and basses and then in bars like 14 and 50 when you have the solo trumpet in there like it's just a whole bunch of interesting orchestration happening that uh it, it doesn't really follow a very specific pattern um, that that kind of makes me feel like this could work really well for a, uh, a film. And uh, the one that came to my mind was um, Fantasia 2000, like thinking of Mickey walking around with his wizard head and messing things mm. up. And um, yeah, like you could feel like he could make a wrong step at any term, uh, any any turn. And uh, when you hear the main theme at the very end, though, like that feels like there's a sense of regality restored. That maybe is the wizard lecturing Mickey, like, "What's what are you doing?" And then um, yeah, and then it, it ends with a really tumultuous ending. So that's probably just him slapping Mickey in the butt with a broom sort of thing. But yeah, yeah, see, Joy Knight says, fun and quirky disney feel, exactly, yeah. So overall, I, I think it, it served that filmic purpose, again, really, really well, and um, just a really fun time overall, for sure. Any thoughts, Gavin? Uh, nice. That's all I got on this one. <laughs> Ultra descriptive, <laughs> love it. <laughs> um, oh, I I liked the clip clops at the beginning. That there was go. another. It was, it was clear what was sort of intended there. Mm -hmm. So it brought me into the picture. Yeah, actually, it says um, <clears throat> printed in the score, horse approaching. So, so there's mm -hmm. no ambiguity about it. That's definitely what's happening. <laughs> oh uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, it's got horse approaching. It's nice. Um, yeah, I, I love the descriptiveness of this one as well. Um, just to talk about the uh, the harmony was appropriately weird, going from A minor to C minor, that sort of minor third jump, which is so often seen in octatonic music. Not that this is octatonic, but you just hear it a lot. Um, and I like how it really commits to the five four meter. It's like you never get a regular <laughs> four four in the whole thing or any kind of even meter. And it, it works. There's this kind of off kilter feel to it the whole way through. Um, and the, the, the use of orchestration, the color, and I just talk about that for a minute, the use of pizzicato and arco unisons. So at the same time, we have the same pitch with these two different colors at the same time, very imaginative kind of scoring. Uh, there are these wailing glissandi in the clarinets to sound almost like a, a wolf howling into the night. Um, which is a nice effect and constantly changing the instrumentation of the melody often without doubling just so we hear that kind of solo effect because remember they're scoring for a small ensemble here so it's nice to get those kind of solo colors um, into the mix and care has been taken not to overtax the players you know this is a very um, careful kind of scoring but still a lot of different kinds of colors in it um, so the only question i really have here is if this one has a kind of swagger to it, I think because of the 5-4, but also the kind of moderate tempo, should it be this, shall we say, cartoonish? You know, there there is, like I say, a cartoonish element to the image. Um, how far can we push it, right? That's, this is, I think, approaching that line. Um, so I think if it was to go that way, you could interpret it as, um, I mean, Chris has already said, talking about this Disney-esque feel with the Fantasia, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, it, it certainly could be viewed that way. That's, it's just a question, it's not a uh, criticism really, just something to, to ponder. Because we've seen um, some very dramatic ones with this one and, and some very serious, and this is going the other way, where it's, it's more on the, uh, the cartoonish feel. But we're very well done as well. So very good. I think um, the artist Andy Walsh actually mentions Disney in his description of the image. Oh, does he? Driving, like the, okay. this kind of Disney spooky hollow, but that's that's you know extra image material. You know, it's not part of the main thing. Um, 
Before we move to the next one, I just want to highlight uh, one comment that we had, which was I had to learn how to score and the software to enter this competition. And I thought that was that was awesome. You know, I love that that this is that that's what this is doing. You know, that's really a lot of the spirit of this competition is just to get people writing and enjoying learning to write music and all that. So I really appreciated seeing that. That's really awesome. Um, okay, are we ready to go to the next one? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Wicked Road from Niklas. first yeah okay sounds good um really liked the i guess the main thing i'd point out here is that um the rhythm of the main melody was really i thought quite creative or i really liked the articulation of it with the grace notes in it the way things were tied together um it felt very like um i don't know it felt very emphatic and uh and creative, so I I, uh, I quite enjoyed that. Um, that's all I got. What do you guys have? Uh, well, so yeah, I mean, motivically, um, the so this is another ABA, sort of an AABA, if you like, with an introduction, and um, the the melody was sort of, can I say, Nimbus two thousand, Harry Potter? It's a little bit of that sort of uh, magical side. So we haven't really seen uh, much of that kind of interpretation of the image, because there is something not just eerie, but you could say um, magical in a sort of, you know, wizard kind of way. Um, so I think it went in that sort of direction and it was done very well. Um, because it had that sort of, um, you know, minor key with a sharp four kind of sound, which is uh, very typical for creating a sort of magical or mysterious kind of mood, uh, a scale we call a Hungarian minor, if you're interested. Um, so I used a lot in, in film and, and John Williams in particular. Um, and so the, in terms of the, the harmony, um, it, I mean, it was very, like I say, magical. I mean, maybe you could throw in some kind of gnarly harmony just, uh, you know, once in a while, just to throw in some dissonance, not to say that it, it wasn't great the way it is. It's beautiful. I'm just saying in terms of the relevance to the image, maybe just some other weird chord, a weird semitone just for the sake of that kind of relevance. Um, now the orchestration, uh, I like that the harp had this nice idea right at the start. It was actually participating in the kind of um, the um, back and forth between the melody and accompaniment and um, adding to the pizzicato sound. So a nice combination there. But I, I'd like to see 
um, even more of the harp after that, because what you did with after that was mainly use it for an effect instrument, like it was this glissando type thing, which is great, you know, very filmic and atmospheric. Um, maybe just to bring it back some 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 point that seems appropriate, maybe the B section, maybe a closing section, just something to kind of give it more um, justification for being there and used in that way. So, but I mean, the instrumentation was was very idiomatic uh, and and handled very very well and, and traditionally. So, good job. Yeah, one thing I want to piggyback on uh, for uh, something that Gavin said regarding the melody, like it had a, a really great balance, I think, of complexity, but also not being overly complex to the point where it's really difficult to remember. So, I'm just looking at the score now. So it's kind of like. So you get a mix of like sixteens, eights, and quarters at the very end, and it just can, like keeps you on your toes the whole way through, but it doesn't overly repeat any uh, singular rhythm as well. So uh, it's just a very, I, I guess, effective way of writing a melody that uh, that takes simplicity but also complexity into account and the fact that it's moving at a quick enough tempo where we can group all of that into one phrase is also a testament to the compositional um, ability here i think um yeah and then in terms of the orchestration and and the harmony mark and uh someone in the comments were saying very john williamsy which is so true and i think uh, i heard some you know trumpet triad in there they were doing some I don't know if it was exactly what planing or anything, but they, they had that really emphatic Harry Potter type of sound that um, definitely evokes that, that spooky type of feeling, which is really, really nice. And then, yeah, just a lot of textures being used throughout, especially at the ending, using those ascending triplets and the strings, that was super effective. And um, yeah, just another big, big finish at the end to uh, round it off. So yeah, super, super fun as well. Everything is going so well. <laughs> Yeah, and somebody was saying um, "double trouble" reminds me of, reminds me of, mm. of that piece. Yeah, I totally agree. Maybe it's even <laughs> more so than the um, than the Nimbus two thousand theme. Yeah. So. All right. Good work. Any other thoughts, Gab? Did wait? Did Gavin go first? Sorry, I'm losing my. I did. Head. Gavin went first. Yes. He yeah. did. Yeah. Right. I was like, now it's your turn. No, wait. <laughs> Thank right. you. Appreciate that. We're ready for the next one. You have to go yeah. twice every time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then we're at number 10, Orchestral Sketch from Rui Ming Zhang. Wow, so dramatic. Uh, I think this is the uh, the most serious one we've had so far and, and not um, not pushing towards the cartoonish at all. So so nicely done. Uh, very dramatic unison to start things off. It, it sounds almost like the beginning of a, a romant, romantic symphony, you know, but it, it continues uh, and, and gets to this almost like a horror-like state in the end. It's just like all hell breaks loose in those last, what, six bars or so. 
um, with the same melody coming in too. Is it just like, it, it's like it's screaming at us, um, which is great, a nice effect. Um, so I like the moodiness of this one in terms of the relevance to the image. Um, it combines these dramatic punctuations with more still and lyrical kinds of statements. Um, and uh, just talking about talking about the uh, the the yeah the ominous aspect of the image. Um, it, it's like there's a sense of real danger and death in this scene, and not just this like I say cartoonish or exaggerated form of it. Um, so I, I like that. And in terms of orchestration, um, the harp used as an accompaniment, the main accompaniment uh, instrument in uh, around measure 12 or so is a nice idea. Um, and it just a, a little suggestion I might say to add, try adding some more layers of material. So uh, think in terms of what sustained notes could be added for a chord or perhaps a little flourish between phrases or maybe a little bit of counter melody to flesh it out a bit, um, things like that. So I, I like the kind of structure and the moodiness, just a little bit of um, material to kind of spice things up in the orchestration. But um, I think it was it was really well handled, very dramatic, very appropriate. So very well done. Yeah, I would totally agree. I feel like this is one of those pieces that has um, a very clear certain direction, like Mark was mentioning. So a very ominous sort of opening and then very intentionally uh, builds up more and more and the very end, it just, like Mark said, hell breaks loose. And um, yeah, I don't really have anything particular to say about, you know, the the harmony or the the orchestration or whatever, because it, it all feels very cohesive and, and well done and balanced. But yeah, I, I thought it, it took a really unique approach to the image um, and, yeah, overall evoked a very uh, sort of ominous sort of quality that, that works really well in this case. So, yeah, really cool. Yeah, I definitely shared the sense with Mark that there it wasn't this sort of cartoonish danger of, you know, vaguely he's he's going to get you. Um, but there's <laughs> some real some real risk of death here. Uh, so that was, you know, Def definitely the most serious piece we've heard so far, most ominous. Um, also just since, we, since we're staring at the scores on our end, I just wanted to um, kind of bring attention to, uh, this is very carefully engraved, like even on, on the last page, there's some specific Boeing instructions. I really, I find the double ties on the, on the harp on, uh, on page three, that'd be very, you know, that's, it's a very beautiful document. Um, so, you know, kudos for, for spending time on your score and, uh, and making it specific. Um, that was the thing that stood out to me with the document summarizing this piece. Yes. Okay, shall we go to number 11? Let's do it. All right, next we have Midnight Gathering from Eric Calizzo.
yeah, this is my type of piece. Um, yeah, like the, oh man, the first thing that stood out to me, first of all, I, I love the, the main theme, first of all, and I love how it continues to come back amidst everything that's happening. Um, it has a very clear sort of, uh, like, I guess statement. When, when it comes in, like, you know it's there all the way back in C minor and the little, uh, Little little key changes you have here and there also uh, work super duper well. I think, let me just take a quick look here. Um, okay, yeah, I'm gonna not have it as, as quickly planned out as I wanted it to, but I believe it was C minor, then you had like E flat major to G, but then you went to D major to G again before going back to C. So you were like going up chromatically, right? Da 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 da. And then back down to C minor again. So though those moments, like you have the tritone in there from the D flat to G, then you get the two, five, one, back to the C. So much creativity happening in there. And then just orchestrationally, everything seems so fun. I especially love the ending. That was that part was uh, one of my favorites with the ascending staccatos and the woodwinds and then letting the strings take over at the very end. And this is one of the only pieces I think that actually ended quietly too. So that, that, that was uh, something that stood out to me too, because most of the piece was nice and exciting and, and momentum based. And then at the very end, it's like, see you later. And that's it, just tapered off. I liked it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention some something that a couple people are talking about in the chat, how it's, it's really difficult uh, it can be really difficult if you are, you know, someone like me without classical training. Um, that if you're the stage of moving from your DAW to notation software, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think you know, I've found it to be a really interesting um, workflow. To I start in my DAW and then I get it into notation software, and then you know, visually you can see a lot in a score that you can't see in your DAW. That like, oh, looks like there's five measures that the woodwinds aren't doing anything. Um, and you get new ideas, and then you end up bringing it back into your DAW for the actual kind of mock-up process. Um, so I guess I just wanted to share, you know, that the people in the comments who feel that that's challenging, like you are not alone. Um, I, I also feel that way. Um, and that it can be, you know, going through, like with Akigami, I went through a few cycles of that. And I'd recommend folks who are you know, are still getting their notation chops together uh, to go through a few cycles in their workflow as well. All right, guys, I guess I'm up now. Um, so Chris, did you hear any Sorcerer's Apprentice in this one, any Fantasia from this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think yeah. especially in the, in the pits in the low strings and then the staccatos and the and the high woodwinds though that definitely gave me that effect like the dun, the dun. As, but, and, you know the, the the two five ones in there definitely helped with that too right yeah <laughs> but for uh, sure yeah the tonal this would be atonal i don't know yeah because i mean i'm hearing a lot of that this kind of duca influence or even uh funeral march of a marionette by Gounod, mm -hmm. if you know that piece sort of brings some of the macabre into this um but almost a humorous version of it, right? In those kinds of pieces. So yeah. um, very appropriate, um, relevant for this image again. And uh, the triplets, I think we've, we've seen a lot, I've heard a lot of triplets in these images. So they, there's something that evokes a kind of lightness or dance-like feel to a lot of these. Um, and it may be that sort of uh, Disney-esque um, kind of feeling in the image. Uh, so it, it's it's appropriate, you know. I, I don't care how many times it's used; it's always good. Um, th th this one, um, I'd, I'd say harmonically, the one obsession that this piece really seemed to have was on the Phrygian two chord, the flat two, yeah. which was all over the place. It's just great, you know. Take one idea and really go to town with it, and and you did that uh, brilliantly with this in all different ways, and not just the flat two used in the main theme, which is a nice effect, but you're going to different keys or flat two of five flat two of going to like you went to f sharp minor at some point from c minor like it's, it's crazy it's just it's wonderfully crazy uh, um but yeah that that obsession with the flat two i think was a, a good way to kind of thread all the ideas together through the 90 seconds here um, in terms of the orchestration the texture was kept light enough 
to hear all those solo wind textures. And remember, we only have one player on each wind, so it's, it's good to lighten that texture as you did so we can hear everything. Um, yeah, and then I think that's about it. I mean, um, just in terms of the main melody, uh, maybe add some breathing room for clarinet at, and you know around measure seven or so. But I mean, it's nothing that would disturb the character, the piece. Um, they're just really small things, just to make sure. It's sort of like insurance to make sure that your uh, that the players get the best performance for you in uh, in in the real playing of it. So yes, another another strong entry. Good job, guys. Good job on everyone so far is what I mean by that. Not, not that this was composed by a bunch of guys. Not only, right? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean now? Uh, folks. folks. Good job, yeah. folks. Good job, folks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's head to number 12. He is coming, Arwan Ariano. Who's first? Gavin, I think. I think it's Gavin. Yeah, Gavin. Yeah. <laughs> like when when I'm in doubt, it's probably. <laughs> um, yeah, I really liked uh, really liked how much the uh, the French horns were a very like very much a player, um, and it's like very much a a uh, if if not a main character at least a supporting character. Um, and it's doing like counter melody work, or you know, I think even um, on on page two here, um, measure measure seven. You know, they're kind of taking the main melodic material. I thought that was really cool and unique. I've not really heard any of our submissions so far do that. So, you know, kudos there. I think the the French horn is a a lovely part of the orchestra. Um, also, quite liked. I've never seen this type of. Uh, formatting with like the time and tempo map on the top of the score but that was i think that's quite cool for you know working in your session um mm -hmm. hints at a film composer mm -hmm. yes one one might one might suspect that this person mm -hmm. intends it to be for film <laughs> that's that's what i got yeah no i i'd agree with all those kevin um and just to add to the kind of spookiness, some things I hadn't seen before were, say, in, in measure three, right? When it's getting going, you hear this dissonance in the middle of the texture. So you get like basically a C minor chord, but then a B is thrown right in the middle of it. And normally you'd say, well, it's a B and a C minor chord, so it's a minor major seven. But it's thrown in, in the middle. Like, let me just play that for you so you can hear it. You know, this kind of grittiness in in the middle register. So it's it's creates a different kind of sound than does just a straight 
straight up minor major seven chord. So a, a, a unique approach to the harmony through this kind of voicing of the chord. Um, so so good job on that. And um, this sense of the, the five four melody, right? This coming in later on um, had a good sense of the wonkiness for the kind of Halloween like character for the image. Um, and, and as you mentioned, Gavin, the colors uh, and, and textures here, I'll just point out the harp again as a compliment. I mean, um, the harp is a good choice because with, within the confines of the restrictions here, it's, it's sort of more unusual. I mean, you can always have string accompaniment or have the winds and brass, but the, in terms of percussion, what you have for pitch, uh, pitch percussion is really the harp. So it's, it's a nice choice just to add somewhere in there for the kind of um, accompaniment. And and that and then that gets it going right to start here in this kind of weird, creepy ostinato. So it's wonderfully done. Um, I think that's that's about it. Um, yeah, I think if I was to suggest anything, maybe just make more of of the five, uh, the five beat section. Um, I, I I love the whole atmosphere at the beginning, and it, it's maybe just like I like both things, and I just would like to hear more of that because it felt like more of a main. Um, part of the piece to me. Um, so if there is a way to sort of get to that sooner without destroying the sort of atmosphere that you build in there, um, I might try to do that. And I realize it's really difficult in the confines of these 90 seconds, um, but something I might I might just try try to do. Um, but still, very, very good stuff. Yeah, um, picking up on the, the harp comment there, um... Yeah, the, the overall feeling I'm getting from these four four sections, wrapping up the beginning and the end, I think it's just a very sinister type of ominous feeling that uh, because the harp is such a delicate instrument, when you have it all, almost on its own, right? The, the only other thing you have is the Berlin strings with the cellos and the basses there outlining the very bottom. And then you have you know the brass coming in there just to warm it up a little bit. But overall, just having the harp there at the beginning and the end makes it feel even scarier in a way because it's so so delicate it's like what's about to happen is something about to like explode in my face right the kind of at the beginning and the end your heart comes in there um but then overall i just i, I really enjoyed the the structure of this like mark mentioned the the five four feel kind of takes you on a journey there and just overall it really moves the momentum forward and the, the speed just just suddenly increases uh really nicely with those different textures and um yeah and then and at the very end i, I feel like I would probably like the harp just to end on a, a single note. I'm not sure we need those eighth notes trailing off and just having the harp be the last thing we hear. Like, I like how the flute, oboe, and clarinet kind of have that long um, whole note. So maybe the harp can just do a, a slight broken chord or something, but unless, unless the, the intention there is to let it continue trailing off, you know, getting softer and softer and softer, that might, might be the intention as well. But I'm just hearing maybe just a simple C octave or a very quiet C minor chord to wrap it up with the woodwind at the same time. At least it gives you that sense of finality there. But, but I don't know. Overall, it's really pretty. Okay. Well, we have three more. Shall we get to them? Next, we have Up the Winding Path from Jacob Lack.
All right, so I think I'm up first for this one. Um, <clears throat> so this is another one that plays as a sort of underscore to an imagined scene. Uh, we saw this with one of the other entries as well. So it seems more concerned with uh, capturing quick changes rather than, as I say, an overall mood with a theme, for example. Um, but th there's still structure there, and it, it's not so much motivic as it is in, uh, in terms of a kind of material, if I can explain it that way. So uh, to me, I heard three uh, elements that would come back quite a bit. One of them was prominent, per prominent percussion lines, and it starts off with that galloping effect that we hear at the beginning. So prominent percussion lines, there's also then second flourishes, mostly in parallel triads. We hear a lot of that kind of planing. And then third, a little melodic snippet that sounded kind of like this. So it's all still unified, but done in this very free form kind of way that I think, as I say, suggests this underscore technique. So it's interesting that this has been conjured up twice in these finalists here where um, there's, there's this imagined scene. So I think this is really effective because we have these three elements that are basically um, introduced in that order. So percussion, flourishes, melodic snippet. But it's really the percussion and flourishes which take center stage. And you wouldn't expect that. You'd think like, well, the melody is going to take center stage. But no, it, it doesn't. It's more of this uh, emphasis on color and texture. Um, so, so lots to, to chew on here um, in terms of uh, relevance. Uh, we've, got, we've got a lot here. We've got the slide progression coming back, uh, which is G minor to F sharp major for the incredulous or incomprehensible. Um, and, and very imaginative score. I'm just going to point out, uh, in addition to the wood block at the start, the, uh, the valves halfway effect. This is what it's stating in the score for the end, where it, it says this is for the startled horse giving a whinny. Um, so a nice creative touch for the end there, very different uh, from what we've heard so far. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think most of us are uh, impressed with that whinny at the end. Uh in the comments as well <laughs> everyone's mentioning it um but yeah super super fun piece uh, sorry where ryan were you saying something oh i was just gonna say i don't outside of sleigh ride i don't think i, I hear that too often that that's where i always hear that in the, <laughs> right around christmas <laughs> yes absolutely and there was one moment that especially piqued my attention i think it was like bar 40 uh what is he 41 two, three, four. yeah 45 46 where the oboe kind of came in with a really lyrical tone there and I was expecting uh, a, a melody to flourish there, and then suddenly we leapt into the D section. That was like, oh. But overall, it was really, really, um, really, really pretty. And I think, uh, lot, lot, yeah, just lots of textures going on, lots of different rhythms happening at the same time, especially in the D section when everything's kind of building up to that final moment. Flute's doing a lot of these uh, 32nd, 16th note rhythms at the same time. Like all of that stuff culminating together so yeah again a nice balance of simple and complex um and just yeah yeah having, having a nice direction all the way through but yeah i really enjoyed this one as well yeah definitely also heard kind of that underscore um you know uh, as mark was saying like very effective uh kind of imagining a series of of events um also, just uh, you know, shout out to the performer for being able to, like, the way that that came out at the end, um, that the Winnie actually came out. That's kind of crazy. Um, it, and y'all didn't have to doctor the output or anything, did you? Brian? I don't. Uh, I had some help doing the final mockups. Let me see if I get confirmation on that. Whether that's like standard note performer or not. Right. I mean, totally fine if if, you, if there was some cheating. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's a great so. effect. I see. We're we're also on a delay, so they're hearing your question a little a little after you asked it. But let me see. What's the name of the horse? <laughs> What's, <it? laughs> What's the name of the horse? Um, I love all it. Right, they're not answering. I don't know. I'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. That's just such a cool effect. Typing. Hang on. One sec. We're finding out live. 
It's just much suspense. Typing. No performer. Uh, okay, so the, the composer gave us their output from no performer. So mm -hmm. it would be, it, it, Jacob said it was no performer. I guess the question is to Jacob. Oh, he's, is he here? Oh, okay. He's in the oh, chat. Oh, this was Dr. Jacob's in the chat and he's saying he had an audio version of it from, and, and use it in finale, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Interesting. So yeah, I guess no performer wasn't actually pulling it off. Mm. I see, I see. Quite that way. That makes, that's, that makes more sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. AI is coming for us, guys. <laughs> the great horse whinny scandal of October 20th. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Shall we go on to number 14? All right. We have Witch's Meeting Point from Yorgo Georgopoulos. Is it my turn? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're up. Yeah. So, um, okay. This is another Source Apprentice uh, vibe I'm getting here, especially in that da, 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 like that that part in the middle there. That was really really nice. I, I really enjoyed that a lot. But yeah, I think just a, a lot of um, traditional uh, Halloween or mystery or scary type of vibes here with uh, meta triads and um, uh, tritones and there was, I forgot exactly what, what the key changes were, but I think it started in B minor and then it went to D minor or something and then F minor. So it went up by thirds and then it went back down after that. But just a lot of creativity overall. And uh, this is one where I feel it wasn't over orchestrated. I think there was um, intention in the melody and it was um, clearly heard throughout. There was uh, a lot of textures happening, but they were very consistently similar textures to allow them to be easy, uh, easily and clearly heard at the same time. So um, yeah, th again, this is coming back to the less is more concepts and you, you just, you, you really don't need to overcomplicate anything um, to get your idea across, of course. So yeah, especially at the very end, everything crescendo to that very last chord, it looks like it was a nice SFFZ uh, approach there. So very emphatic ending, but yeah, I just love the the whirling nature of the the last section. They're really driving the the piece home, and uh, yeah, and ending nice and strong as usual. So I know this is kind of rhetorical, but what do you think "over orchestrated" means, or, or when you say that, I guess? What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, it would it would be having um, like as an extreme example, all the different instruments performing completely different articulations, performing um, completely different notes. For example, 
um, even if all the core tones were voiced correctly, having a variety of articulations, like let's say uh, one stroke section is playing tremolo, another playing, uh, you know, flotando, another playing, you know, pizzicato, whatever. Um, at a certain point, the ear can only pick out so many textures to pay attention to at one time. And um, as for me, as at least as a general rule of thumb, I, I try to stay with maybe two to four different textures happening at the same time, just to at least have that sense of cohesion, but not feel like I'm being overwhelmed by any techniques, you know? Right. So complexity for its own sake, even though we're not really even hearing it. Or right. Exactly. Kind of yeah. pushing it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Next, Gavin, I think. Yeah, I, I uh, share, share Chris's opinion that like, you know, we're definitely not over overdoing things. We're not doing anything unnecessary. But uh, this this uh, composer clearly had a very, you know, a wide palette of colors available to them, like many different tools in their Swiss Army knife. And uh, this was just showing us, you know, um, yeah, I can do that too. I can do that too. Um, and I thought it was, I thought it was really uh, varied and really, and really effective. So nice job. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the same, you know, a <clears throat> good variety of combinations. Uh, the instruments certainly aren't being overtaxed. Um, this is another, in terms of structure, it's another ABA form, which is good a solid choice. It's very clear and comprehensively done in this case. Um, now, the Chris already mentioned things like augmented triads and, and other cool harmonic stuff going on. Um, I'd say for the strange and mysterious, I would add things like these chromatic flourishes passed around the orchestra. There is even a flutter tongue in the flutes. Um, might not have come out so well in the uh, no performer here, but there's muted strings, trumpets, changing meters, all stuff that adds to the kind of mysterious quality uh, brought out in the image. Um, now, just in terms of the the scoring of the, the melody has this shape to it where it drops down basically through an octave and then goes a little bit deeper. And I'm wondering, maybe this is just a no performer thing, but it sounds like the register changes so much that the dynamic actually drops down a bit when it gets to those last few notes. So maybe be fine in a live performance. It just, the melody tended to kind of fade out a little bit in those moments of the melody. Now those like da 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 da, that, that little ending bit sometimes got lost in the in the texture there and I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's just a note performer which is something to watch for if you're going to do this live um so i think that's it that's 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 what i got on this one so very good yeah. well then we have one more one more mm -hmm. There's something in the woods from Stefan Eisenkolb Krugel.
I'm first, aren't I? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had I had sort of a question to the rest of the panelists about. Um, so this is our one. Uh, many of our submissions have harp glissandi, and uh, the way that most of them have notated it is it's just starting and ending points with uh, with the little you know squiggly guy in between them. Um, this submission actually specified all of the um, all of the notes and the rhythms of them. Um, are there cases, do we think, in which it is helpful to specify them, or is it just cleaner to use kind of the shorthand? Oh, gosh, that's tough. I'm, um, See what I mean? This, like it's taking yeah, a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm looking where it first comes in, measure 11. Um, th but there seems there seems to be some kind of like um, two two lines coming at the same time. So like they're they're not uh, like it's the same glissando, but but starting at different times. So I think maybe right. that's part of the effect. It's sort of like um, it, it's specific because of the kind of counterpoint, I guess you could call it. It's, it's kind of a, a sure. mush of a sound, but maybe the, just the the notes, what they could sound like against each other. I suppose you could notate it just like starting at endpoints like that. Just just makes it a bit more specific. I mean, it being pretty sure. diatonic, it, I think it would be you know, six of one, half of the other, half dozen the other. It's it's pretty much the same either way. I mean, it's it's probably quicker just to do the squiggle. Um, but this is just to make sure, maybe, to that it comes out that way. Yeah, I think for me, as a rule of thumb, like if the if the glissando features multiple accidental changes and there's like very specific, uh, you know, like effects they're trying to go for and different types of scales that you really want to make sure every single note is understood, then that would make sense. But if it's something sure. like C harmonic minor, right, then you can just write C harp minor if you wanted to and then do the squiggle. But if there's like just maybe one octave has specific sharps in it and then the next octave has different flats in it, then you probably want to be super safe, I guess. Sure. And realistically, there's only so fast that the harpists can change their pedals as well. Right, like they can't, right. You can't actually execute a chromatic run. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's yeah. impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, just a, a nerdy question. <laughs> a good question. Is it me now? I yield my time. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, make sure I know where we are. Yes. Um, so this one was really cool. Um, harmonically, I just want to point something out. This is my 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 term of the day. It's going to be hexatonic cycle. I just I have to throw it out there. Hexatonic cycle. It means that if you're in a hexatonic scale, so this thing here, then you can use triads from that that are all a major third apart, and We've gone with minor chords, a, a major third apart. So it started with C minor, then it goes to E minor, comes back to C, then goes to A flat minor. So you go through all of the minor triads that are possible in that one scale. And the reason I, I point, uh, bring this up is because the hexatonic scale is often used for a sense of the mysterious in film music. And this is one way that it's often done is by using especially minor chords in those kinds of relationships. Um, so maybe you weren't thinking of hexatonic at all. It was just like minor chords and major third apart, but it has that mysterious sound of the hexatonic. So very effective. I haven't seen that yet in these entries. So that was great. Um, and I also liked these brass swells. And for some reason I hadn't seen much of that in these other entries either, but it really sounded like there's something in the woods, so, you know, there's something ready to pounce on us, right? These yeah. these really serious brass swells. Um, and one other thing I noticed was the solo violin. There was um, a line for the solo violin, an inspired choice, I think, especially for a small ensemble that they're scoring for here. Um, only suggestion I would have is to just make more use of it. I, I just, I love that idea. Um, just give it some melodic material, something where it can very uh, sing freely, like a, like a violin is made to do, you know. Um, so it's it's a great choice, you know. Right from the beginning, I think that's where it was. If I can just pull up the score for a minute here, um, yeah. So it's, it says solo violin. I think it comes in in the B section, if I'm not mistaken, um, and it's 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 just sort of touched on, and then it it goes away. So just I'd love to see more of that, but. But a great job. Everything else really, really well done. And even that too, this 
solo violin. Good choice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, orchestration-wise, just picking up on that, overall, I felt it, it featured a very consistent discipline of choosing a specific articulation to evoke a certain emotion or a certain vibe and sticking with it. Um, and then not, not, uh, not overdoing certain techniques and orchestrations to make it feel like there's a ton of stuff going on. Because if I remember correctly, I feel like this is one of those pieces where it feels like every four to six bars, there's something new happening in terms of the harmony or the, the melody. So it's always keeping you on your toes. So while the music is doing all the heavy lifting, the orchestration is allowing the main theme to come out and uh, feature all its instruments properly without adding to the complexity of what's happening musically. So um, I, yeah, it, it's, it's always, a I think, a fine balance between letting uh, the orchestra do a lot of work and creating interest versus the music doing a lot and uh, creating the interest. But I think in this, in this regard, the music does uh, quite a lot of interesting techniques that Mark and um, Gavin already touched on with the harp and then all the other instruments as well. But yeah, just, I think overall today we've, I, at least what I've learned is just, there's so many unique ways to tackle this specific image and everyone tackled it with a mysterious, scary, spooky vibe, but it, all those entries still sounded so different. And so it's just so cool to see. There are various yeah. locations on the Scooby-Doo to horror film there spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's all a question of who's in the carriage, right? <laughs> right. I want to know. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone who submitted music for this. These are these are so fun. These are crazy. Um, so we're going to just do a double check and review the scores, make sure we've got it all sorted out. Uh, I think we're in good shape, but we'll look at that. So. Thank you, huge thank you again to Museversal. They were, uh, they're, you know, awarding these prizes. And so at the beginning, we were supposed to play a video from them and the four of us watched it and apparently everyone else saw a blank screen. So <laughs> we're gonna give that another go and let everybody watch that while we take an extra look at the scores over here, okay? Finding great musicians is not easy. Booking recording sessions is expensive and complicated, but it doesn't have to be. With Museversal, you can go from booking to a live stream session to getting the files in just one hour without breaking the bank. Start by choosing from our curated roster of musicians, engineers, and orchestras. Next, book your ideal recording day, time, and session length. Now this is where the magic happens. You get to join a live stream session and collaborate in real time. It's like being in the control room of your favorite studio. It also means no more emails and no more endless revisions. Finally, right after the session, you'll receive every take in your preferred format. And did we mention that all Museversal sessions are 100% buyouts? Our musicians are among the best in the world with industry-grade gear to deliver the quality you deserve. And most importantly, we pay our roster stable salaries, meaning you can directly contribute to creating a fairer, better music industry. It's not too good to be true. It's Museversal. All right, we've got our scores. I think we're ready. Uh, so I want to remind everyone that we do these competitions so far, quarterly has been our pace, and they go by fast. Uh, so if composing for a chamber orchestra was not your thing, the next competition is going to have a video game twist to it, which uh, will reveal why as we get closer to it, but it's pretty fun. Uh, so let's see. So this was, the scores were crazy close on this one. This was really tight. Uh, I just want to mention a few of the honorary things which are just like you got the highest in a certain category it doesn't necessarily affect the overall score uh, but in the category of composition for uh, the highest score in that specific category we had a tie between Gavin Farah, Alex Crystal Dulu and Eric Galuzzo. Uh so good job to you guys in the category of relevance to the image uh, there was also a tie for Alex Crystal Dulu and 
Giorgio Georgopoulos. And then in the category of orchestration, we had a tie between Gavin Farah, uh, Jacob Black, and Giorgio Georgopoulos. So now third place, who is winning uh, three credits with Musaversal, is Witch's Meeting Point from Giorgio Georgopoulos. Congratulations. You guys are all muted, by the way. Uh, the <laughs> I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, you can unmute if we want to hear your claps. And then yeah, in... you got your uh, pew, pew, pew ready. <laughs> there you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Second place, five credits for Musaversal is Jack of the Lantern from Gavin Farrow. And the first place winner is The Midnight Visit of the Peculiar Mr. Ryan Ooh. from Alex Crystal Dulu. Congratulations, it was everyone. Tight. Tight, 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 tight. But congratulations to everyone. This was so fun. Thank you to Musaversal. This is awesome. Alex, I'll be in touch and we will uh, talk about what to do next because <laughs> it should be fun. But we will, for everyone who's watching, the plan is to, uh, for Alex and I to meet and look at the score and go over it and prepare for the session. We'll meet with Musaversal's producer and get ready for that and then actually do the session and there will be a whole video on the channel. I find it highly unlikely anyone who's watching is not already subscribed, but if not, subscribe so you know when that video is ready. Um, and yeah, I think to close this out, we will play Alex's piece one more time. And unless you guys have any final comments. Oh, I mean, that was fantastic and definitely a, a different twist to this time's competition. This um, seeing how many people did an amazing job with just the interpretations. And again, we've talked about how unique all of them were. Uh, so, so cool. And uh, Ryan's not lying. The scores were super close. Like we're looking at the scores on an Excel mm -hmm. sheet and uh, they were all like this close. So everyone did super, yeah. super well. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, awesome. everyone. Thank you. All right. So here we go. We'll take a listen one more time. It was muted. We'll try that again. Finding great musicians is not easy. Booking recording sessions is expensive and complicated, but it doesn't have to be. With Musaversal, you can go from booking to a live stream session to getting the files in just one hour, without breaking the bank. Start by choosing from our curated roster of musicians, engineers, and orchestras. Next, book your ideal recording day, time, and session length. 
Now this is where the magic happens. You get to join a live stream session and collaborate in real time. It's like being in the control room of your favorite studio. It also means no more emails and no more endless revisions. Finally, right after the session, you'll receive every take in your preferred format. And did we mention that all Musiversal sessions are 100% buyouts? Our musicians are among the best in the world, with industry-grade gear to deliver the quality you deserve. And most importantly, we pay our roster stable salaries, meaning you can directly contribute to creating a fairer, better music industry. It's not too good to be true. It's Musiversal.